All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the second session of the 2021 Citrus Research Board Summer Webinar Series. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM Program, and I'm also here with Dr. Joey Mayorkin of the Citrus Research Board, who will introduce our speakers, and Peter Cosina, who will run the, uh, the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, so with that, I will pass this over to Dr. Joy Mayorkin, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Stephanie. Please welcome our first speaker, Sonia Rios, Subtropical Horticulture Farm Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension in Riverside and San Diego counties. Prior to joining UC Cooperative Extension, Sonia served as a staff research associate for the Tulare and Kings County Agronomy Farm Advisor. Sonia's focus as a farm advisor is on conducting needs assessments for crops like citrus, avocados, and dates. Current projects include high density trials in avocado and weed management for both citrus and avocado. Sonia will soon be conducting meetings and workshops for growers and homeowners on the identification, treatment, and eradication of ACP, HLB in Southern California. Today, Sonia will provide a regional update. With that, Sonia, you should be able to take control of the screen. Thank you so much, uh, Joey. That's funny. I actually knew Joey when he was a grad student at UCR and he used to help me with all of my um, Phytophthora samples. <laughs> so Joey and I go back <laughs> a while, a while back. Um, so once again, um, my name is Sonia Rios. I am the Subtropical Horticulture Farm Advisor. I've been in this position now for going on seven years now. And uh, today I'm just going to talk about what's been happening down in Southern California, what I've noticed, what um, growers have brought to my attention. Um, but first up, I'm just going to talk about in general, um, what's been happening, um, with the amount of fruit that's being produced. Um, remember these are all stats that, um, that most of the time they're lagged behind a couple of years. Um, so things may be different, uh, now compared to they were a couple of years ago. Uh, luckily this one has a forecast of 20, of 2020 to 2021. And it does show that um, this year we are seeing less boxes, less fruit coming in compared to uh, previous years. So here we have a table that shows what California brings in and then compared to what the United States brings in. And so of, of course, California is included in, in, in those numbers. So here we have, um, uh, this is per thousand boxes. So for oranges, um, we have 54, and of course it dropped down to, to 52. Um, once again, as you see, the numbers are um, have slowly declined. Um, I was actually speaking to a grower last Wednesday, and he's in Northern County, San Diego. And he was saying that, of course, we all know that the weather isn't always predictable. And he was saying that he had a really low set along with different growers that are settled throughout um, like Paula um, Valley Center, that they had less yield this year. And they're suspecting it could be because of the weather. It, you know, it did something during flowering because we know that flowering can be affected with weather. Um, so they're probably suggesting that um, they're going to have less um, this year uh, compared to previous years. And um, they're predicting it could be because of the weather. Um, um, just looking at some rankings, uh, this was last year, 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss Riverside's and San Diego's um, um, rankings. So in grapefruit production, Riverside ranked first out of all the counties that produce citrus ranked third in lemons. In San Diego last year, uh, grapefruit ranked third and lemons ranked sixth. Um, so as you guys see here, here are the different uh, counties that do produce citrus. Um, I believe Tulare is um, 
the one that produces the most in general. Um, they have most acreage throughout the state. Um, when it comes to navels, uh, Riverside County ranked six, San Diego right behind with seven, seventh. And then um, when it comes to Valencia's um, in Riverside, they actually went up a little bit compared to last year, um, to 2019. And they ranked seven in Valencia's and ranked third in Pomelo's and the hybrids. In San Diego County, um, they went up also a little bit more. Like I said, this was last year, so we're gonna see probably different numbers for next year's um, next year's uh, meeting. And uh, they ranked fourth, and also they ranked fourth in Pomelos. So that's good. At least we saw we we're seeing some increase. Um, and in Riverside, they ranked fourth in, in Mandarins and Mandarin hybrids. In San Diego, they ranked seventh out of all the counties. And so let's see how many counties there are that have it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 12, 13 ish uh, counties. So more than half, more than 50% on the percentile. And I just wanted to give you guys um, a heads up and just prepare yourselves for the this heat wave. After looking at what Cal Fire has been saying, and um, they're saying that this could be the worst fire season that um, that they might see. Um, that's due to um, uh, you know that's during these heat waves that we do have. So just be prepared for those, stick close to, um, stick close to the news, stick close to what you hear. Um, you wanna make sure that you're prepared for these heat waves. And sometimes what, like in 2018, we had that unexpected four day heat wave that even reached what 119 degrees in Valley Center, um, which is unheard of. Um, but we want to make sure that we are prepared and uh, we want to make sure we watch those temperatures because they could soar above normal and um, that could affect the stomata, that could affect the leaves on, um, um, of course, you guys know that when a tree gets stressed out, it actually closes the stomata to try to reduce any type of moisture loss and you want to make sure that you know, you want to get on a different watering schedule. You don't want to stick with the same watering schedule. You want to prepare your trees prior to this heat wave, you know, a few days before you want to add more water than usual. Um, if you just turn on the water that morning when you know there's a heat wave, most likely the tree is not going to get enough moisture in it to have it, um, to have it, to, to have, have a fighting chance pretty much. So you want to be prepared for that. Um, remember water before, um, whitewash young trees as needed. And like I mentioned before, the heat can affect the bloom and fruit set. And for some reason, the summer is coming up earlier in the springtime during, during, that, um, during that time and it is getting more intense. So with that, you know, you, when you have young trees, you wanna go ahead and apply the mulch when you can, and also this, these tensiometers, the avocado growers use these religiously. And um, it's best that, you know, if you have a new grove or if you wanna test these out, uh, these aren't the type that you just leave in the ground and you walk away from. Uh, these are manual. They're, they're way cheaper than the ones that, um, that you can see through your computer and whatnot. This is just like a general reference. Um, it's always good to have these sorted throughout the grove. Um, and it tells you what the moisture level is within the ground. And there's two levels that you can have it at. Um, grower versus wildlife. Because we are going through a drought and because there are going to be fires here in Southern California, a lot of wildlife does get displaced. Um, I spoke to a grower who had a young juvenile mountain lion that just wouldn't leave his property. He had to call the game warden and there's certain rules to go by. And usually here in um, 
here in Northern San Diego County, um, South Riverside County, we get a lot of deer. Um, and of course, because of the drought, they're gonna come down to um, irrigation lines and to reservoirs and what usually follows behind them, usually mountain lions. Um, there's been an increase in mountain lion uh, sightings, especially in San Diego County. So we just wanna make sure that we're safe out there. We keep an eye out. Um, and also remember deer can also cause damage and cause prolific damage to younger trees as well. So this grower actually has um, wire uh, fencing around each little tree and around the trees in general because um, most of his trees have been stripped by deer. Um, also, uh, this is the time when coyote pups are out. So you want to make sure you watch your irrigation lines. I had a grower call me. Uh, we we're trying to figure out how come his row of trees were dying. There was no pattern, no nothing. It was just a row of trees. And then we found out that most of the irrigation lines that that were semi buried were all chewed up and it was because of coyotes. Um, usually from, I don't know, March to, to late July, the pups are teething. And there's not so much that they need the water, but they like the plastic of it. Um, if you wanna know more about coyotes, I would, call, I would probably contact Neve Quinn. I'm just reporting to you guys what I've been seeing. Um, so just keep an eye out for your rows, your irrigation lines, um, because the coyotes are out. Um, what I've also heard growers talk about is also um, the amount of money on labor. Um, this is, you know, especially for the small farms in San Diego County, um, they have to do most of their own labor and it's really hard to one, to find labor, um, two, to be able to afford um, labor and to make sure that the labor gets there on time for them to be able to pick their fruit. Because if not, you wait too long, the fruit can get puffy on the tree and you don't want that. And unfortunately, um, in 2019, remember this, these, these stats are always gonna be a year, year or two behind. Um, um, at 11.9, California had the largest percentage of total expenditures. So how much money is basically spent on farms? This is farms in general. And of course, labor took the biggest chunk. Um, and of course, with labor going up, um, it's becoming um, something for the growers to be struggling in. And this is also expenditures. Um, we're looking at about 50% of the people that do have farms uh, reply to this request. So this is about 50%. And it seems here that in millions of dollars that labor once again ends up being the most amount, the biggest amount of money uh, expenditure that they do have to spend money on. And in 2019, it increased. I'm sure in 2020 and 21, it exceeded that. Um, so we have to, um, Sorry, my screen's not cooperating with me. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, so expenditures for California in 2019, six six hundred and ten thousand dollars compared with um, around five hundred thousand in 2018. It went up. Um, totaled California's total farm production expenditures. Um, was 42.7 billion in 2019, a 16% increase from the 2018 um, estimate of 36.8 billion. Um, so on average, California producers spent the most money on labor, farm services and feed. Remember this is going across all type of farms in California. And, um, and of course, labor and rent are up there as well from the previous year. And of course, in San Diego, the land is just so expensive now that um, people are going out of business because, you know, if they don't make 
their minimum cut when it comes to production, or especially with tree crops, you, you do have to wait for it to start producing, you can go into debt and buy just rent. Um, so um, that's something that our growers have to deal with. And so I've, you know, we've noticed that um, we feel like we're losing growers here in Southern California because it's just so expensive to produce. Um, and then with the mandates with the citrus psyllid, the quarantines, it's getting um, really tough to try to get growers um, to, you know, to start growing again in Southern California. Um, so I'm just letting you guys know with that in mind that I am teaching a, um, a, a citrus production course. Um, we have all the topics that you can think of. This year, I changed it. I actually, instead of once a week for seven weeks, it's twice a week for eight weeks. And there are two field trips this time for it. And this year, I am getting CCA and PCA CEUs for the course. Um, um, I lowered the price just a little bit so you can get several, I'm trying to think of how many CEUs are in each, but a lot of this, there's a lot of CCAs um, units with this as well, and they will be held on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 11. Um, there are field trips set on the 30th and October 3rd. And let me just show you guys, um, this is the lineup. <laughs> that we have. So it is going to be a lot of courses, a lot of information. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, if you can join the class, that would be great. Uh, we have anyone who's, anyone who's ever worked in citrus within the state. We have uh, Greg from up north. Uh, we have my predecessor, Gary Bender. Uh, we have Henry Herrera from Cal Fire. We, um, mentioned some um, some stuff about wildfires, especially when we're pertaining to Southern California, what to do before and after a fire, um, hot pests. So we're thinking of scales, um, um, any other type of pests that are out there, um, which our new farm advisor will be um, speaking about. Um, we have vertebrate pests, diseases, um, the two field trips, pruning, how to read water and soil tests. So um, I highly suggest that, you know, if you can take these courses, I'm also offering them as individual courses as well. So if for some reason you can't attend the entire thing or just want to know about certain topics, then you can go ahead and pick and choose which classes that you want to take. Uh, so I'm highly encouraging you guys to sign up for that. I'm actually going to put it in the box as soon as this text, um, as soon as this is over. Um, but besides that, are there any questions? And just letting you guys know that um, these photos, I really like these photos. These are probably my favorite ones. Um, I hosted a ACP uh, outreach and extension about a couple of years ago. So these are some of the photos from that event and we would actually go out to the field. So this is right, this is right before COVID. So we were able to go out to the field and we we're able to actually teach people how to do that. Okay, so we, we actually do not have time for questions. Thank you, Sonia, so much. And I'm going to pass this back to Joey to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Stephanie. Please welcome our second speaker, Dr. Sandeep Agatam, Assistant Research Entomologist at the Kearney Agricultural Research and Extension Center. Prior to joining Kearney, Dr. Gatam served as a postdoctoral research associate at Oklahoma State University researching phosphine resistance in insect pests of stored product. Dr. Gadam's current research efforts are focused on insect biology, ecology, behavior, pesticide efficacy, fumigation, and pesticide resistance for citrus pests in California. This July, Dr. Gadam will join UCANR as an Assistant Cooperative Extension Area Citrus IPM Advisor, where her program will focus on studying strategies for integrated pest management methods of arthropod pests of citrus in the San Joaquin Valley. Today, Dr. Gadam will provide an update on citrus IPM efforts underway. And with that, Sandeepa, you should be able to take control of the screen. Okay. Um, thank you, Joey, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sandeepa Gautam. Uh, currently, I'm an assistant research entomologist, and soon I'll be joining UCNR as cooperative extension IBM advisor, and I'm really excited about it. Um, today, I'm going to speak to you on California Red Scale, um, California Citrus 
integrated pest management and give you some updates. Here is the outline that I'm going to follow today. We'll first talk about key pest of citrus. And then um, after that, we'll talk in detail about California Ready Scale monitoring and management. Um, after that, we'll talk about ASIN citrus salinity scouting and management. And if there is time to talk about other pests, we'll talk about other citrus pests. <clears throat> California has more than 260,000 acres of citrus, 75% um, of which is grown here in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, coastal regions mostly has uh, lemons and southern uh, regions have navels and valencias, and um, there are some grapefruit in the desert area. The trend um, is that older orchards and valencias are being replaced by mandarins, which are becoming more and more popular and um, increasing every year. Now, because the weather conditions are different in these different citrus growing regions, and because there are different varieties that are grown in different citrus growing regions, the pest priorities in these different regions are different. Um, Asian citrus salad, which regulations have pretty much kept out of the San Joaquin Valley, um, is an occasional pest here in the valley and may require, may require eradication treatments if it sows up. Um, but in the coastal and southern regions where ACP has established, it's a number one priority for our growers. In the valley where temperature is hot and um, dry in the summer, our key pests are California red scale, citrus strips, citricola scale, um, and ants. In the coastal region in Southern California, where temperature is mild and supports natural enemies throughout the year, these pests, ready scale, citrus strips, and um, citricolous scale are pretty much kept in control by natural enemies. And in addition to these, there are several species of um, insects that are not necessarily pests, but are because they're present in citrus, they're quarantined um, issues in other countries where we export citrus, they are a problem for our growers if they want to ship fruit overseas to markets like South Korea and um, New Zealand and, and Australia. So what this means is our pest issues are different um, in different citrus growing regions. So now let's talk about California red scale. Um, red scale is a sap sucking insect. It attacks all parts of citrus trees, including the fruit. Heavy infestation can cause dieback of branches um, and yield loss. It also downgrades the fruit because you know just presence of the um, red scale on fruit makes it look look ugly. Now let's talk a little bit about what does the red scale looks like and what uh, what the life cycle is in um, citrus orchards. The red scale life cycle begins um, as a gravid female, when the gravid females start producing crawlers, which looks like a spot um, if you look at it from the top. But when you actually flip it over, you can see the crawlers. Crawlers are the only moving stays, except the males that can fly. And that's how the California red scale disperses. When the crawlers hatch and come out, they move on a twig or a branch and find um, a place where they insert their mouth parts and start feeding. And that's where they molt and grow and reproduce and die, um, especially for females. When the crawler starts feeding, they start producing um, waxy material to cover themselves up, which is kind of protective layer um, to cover the scales. That's what the scale is made of. And as the scale develops, it goes through molt. The first molting, um, the, that's the first molt, which um, aids a ring to, um, to the scale. For the female, um, it goes through two, two molts, first time from first to uh, second instar, and second time from second to third instar. The second instar looks like a teardrop, both for uh, males and females, and as it grows, the the females change in shape, and the third instar female look more like uh, a plump blob 
with uh, with loops. And if you flip that scale over, you can see two mold rings for um, for the females. Now for males, molds two to um, two to four times. First between first and second mold, and then from second to prepupa, then pupa, then adult. Why is it important that we know about, you know, we care that red scale males mold four times because insect growth regulators that are targeted to control um, red scale is more effective to control males than females because these um, these insecticide treatments target molting stages, which is why um, it's important to know about um, about the life stages. So we can use this information about different life stages for monitoring, which can be done in three different ways. First, and a rather popular one at it, uh, is the pheromone traps, using pheromone traps to monitor male flight. Many years of work has uh, been spent on developing these pheromone cards that you can hang out in the orchard uh, with a lure that you replace every month, and you count the number of adult number of adult males that you catch in these traps to predict the male <clears throat> male flight. The second one um, is crawler using crawler tapes to um, target when the crawlers start emerging. This is a really popular one with researchers. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> researchers to time insecticide applications. And what we do here is you, we use a double sticky tape to wrap around the twig, um, like in this picture over here, next to a female. And when the crawlers start emerging and start moving, the crawlers get trapped there and you do that weekly, you can pretty much tell when the crawler start emerging. The third way to monitor um, for radius scale is to determine person disinfested fruit. And this is more for targeting the next season. If you find that more than 5% of your harvested fruit has um, radius scale infestation, then you probably need to do something about it um, in the next, next year. So ferment traps, how do we, um, how do we use it? Um, put out the traps early in the season um, before the first male flight. And um, it's two to four traps per 10 acre block and additional two traps for ex each additional 10 acre, um, 10 acre of block. And replace these traps by weekly and count the number of um, males on these traps to determine when the peak male flight is occurring. Um, many years of work uh, went into determining how to effectively count <clears throat> males on the traps. And what the researchers found is that if <clears throat> you're counting the red scale um, within these squares, which represent about 20% of, um, of the card, and multiply that number by uh, five, you get the total number of um, total number of males per card to um, to predict the male um, male flight, and some years you you might get a very a light infestation as shown in the left card. Other years you might get a card that is covered with red scales. And what you can do about uh, this is what pest control advisors have been practicing is when you get a heavy infestation like that, you carefully count and keep a reference that you can go back to in future. And when you get a similar heavy infestation later in the future, you can just look at it and say that's that's 10,000 uh, red scale per card, and that's that's too much. And how you can use this uh, Fairman cards is you can use them a couple of different ways um, to predict the male flight. Based on the number of trap catches, you graph it, and you can you know using the using these numbers, you can actually see when that first generation male uh, flight peak is happening. In the valley, the peak flight is sometime around in March, and the second generation male flight is sometime around in June, depending on the temperature. Um, 
There are third generation and fourth generation of Redis scale as well, but those are not as uh, defined picks as first generation and second generation um, Redis scale because there is a lot of overlapping uh, populations after the second generation to actually see the pick. So what PIST Fundor advisors have been doing is they traditionally put out pheromone cards to watch population on a weekly basis and put them out um, during the fourth flight to predict the next generation of, um, of ready scale and use that information together with the degree days to predict when the travelers are emerging. <clears throat> so you track, I'm sorry. <coughs> so you track the first mid flight and from that you can predict pretty much the rest of the events using the degree day model, which is accumulation of average daily temperature above the lower development threshold for radius scale, which is 53 degree Fahrenheit. The first crawler emergence takes 550 degree days after the first male flight. Then the second male flight is 1100 degree days after the first, uh, first male flight. And the second crawler emergence is after 650 day, degree days after the first male flight. And why this is important is because with insecticide applications, we're targeting um, crawlers and first, first instars. Now, degree days, how does this work? Um, all insects develop based on temperature and they don't develop above the lower developmental threshold um, which is 53 degree Fahrenheit uh, for California Redis scale. Any temperature accumulation that is above the lower developmental threshold is what counts towards degree days. Um, and for Redis scale, that's anything above 53 degree centigrade, uh, 53 degree Fahrenheit. Um, now let's look at two different scenarios and kind of talk about why it is important that we monitor degree days um, for determining what life stays of uh, ready scale is out in the field. In the springtime, you may have a high of 77 degree Fahrenheit and a low of 45 degree Fahrenheit, which gives, gives you an average of 61. And the degree days you get out, uh, get from that is 61 minus 53 degree Fahrenheit, which is lower developmental threshold for ready scale. You have eight degree days per day. And to reach that 550 degree days after the male flight to crawler emergence, you need about 69 days. So what that means is things are happening slowly during the spring because of the temperature. Now that changes once we hit the summer and daily temperatures are much higher than in the spring. So in this example, if you have a high of 105, low of 83, you get an average daily temperature of 94 degrees. And when you subtract the lower developmental threshold, which is 53 degrees centigrade Fahrenheit from 94, you get 41 um, degree days. And with that kind of degree day accumulation, it only takes about 500 and um, it only takes about 14 days to get to that 550 50 degree days for the next life stage. So, for the ready scale, you really want to be, if you really want to know what's going on with the ready scale in your block, you want to be monitoring the male flight and using degree days um, to determine what life stages are, are present in the field. Okay. Now uh, let's talk about California ready scale management choices. The information that I have presented here is from many, many, many years of work uh, research done by Dr. Beth Cotton Carwell. And um, thanks to her, we, we have a lot of choices. Uh, we have seven, um, your choices are seven steam center, Movento oils, which is uh, for organic growers and apitis. All these um, are rated as moderately effective because none of the, none of these choices are super toxic to rate scale. They all have issues. For example, seven and steam have um, resistance issues. Center, um, although effective, it allows for skills to survive. So it's moderately effective. 
Movento is very effective against um, very scale that are on leaves and fruit, but it doesn't kill the very scale that are present on wood, allowing populations to survive. So it's moderately effective. Oils um, are fairly effective if you time it right and hit the right space, but they have salt residuals. And if you miss it, you miss it. Ephyte is um, moderately effective because the efficacy can differ from um, year to year, from situations to situations. The next here on the table, um, the third column is selectivity. And what I mean by that is how toxic are these compounds to natural enemies? Seven, which is organ um, carbonyl insecticide is toxic to most natural enemies. Steam and sun center are toxic to beetles like Veralia beetles. They're growth regulator, they mess up with the uh, hormone balance and center um, affects the chitin synthesis and affects uh, molting of beetles as well. Movento is toxic to predatory mites. Oils um, are broadly effective, very effective on a short term, but um, they don't have a long, long term effect on natural enemies, and natural enemies can rebound. Um, a fight is, is non toxic, it's a non, non toxic option. In terms of spectrum, um, especially if you're trying to target more than one pest with your insecticide applications, it's important to know, you know, uh, what these applications do to variety of pests that you have. So if you have red scale, citricola scale, and full rose beetle that you're trying to control, seven might be your best choice. Um, steam is pretty narrow. Um, it targets red scale only. Center, on the other hand, has some effect on citricola scale as well. Um, and if, you're, if you want to control SN citrusylid together with red scale, move into is your best choice. Um, oils, oil application broadly controls all of the pests, but again, it's uh, it doesn't have residual effect. It's a short term. Um, and aphidis is targeted to um, California red scale. Okay. Now, how to use the life cycle of um, California red scale for making pest management choices. Seven and oil are going to be most toxic to crawlers and white caps because they are tiny. The white cap is not very protective. So if when you're targeting um, control of red scale, you want to get the most kill and you will want to target the states that's most sensitive. And that's crawler and um, white caps with seven. With growth regulators, steam and center, you are trying to get the compound before the molting happens. And red scale molds different time, you know, males and females mold different times in their life stage. Females mold twice, uh, males mold four times, twice is more compared to uh, females. So steam here may be more effective in controlling red scale males compared to females. Center, which is also insect growth regulators, attack, um, attacks differently. It affects the um, chitin synthesis, which is required for molting. And Movento kills all life stages. It's effective on all life stages, but if you're targeting um, highest kill percentage, uh, it's better to apply when the life stage is crawler and, you know, first in stars so that you get a higher percentage kill because it's the white cap is not very protective and crawlers are uh, just, you know, don't have any protective covering. Aphytis, um, if you're releasing aphytis in your grove, you really want to target the third in star females because that's what they like. Um, aphytis does affect second and star males and females, but what it prefers is third and star, um, third and star female. So when you look at your population, your trap card, and you, you have all these big male flights and you want to target um, 
let's like say you want you have a compound that you have in mind to use, you want to target these specific life stages, then um, the life cycle can guide you to make a right management choice. Next is when to spray, uh, making the best management decisions. Best control advisors have traditionally relied on um, pheromone cards to watch for populations and um, on a weekly basis and then make management decisions. But these pheromone cards were designed for organophosphates and carbamate insecticides, and they may not accurately predict male populations for newer method of control, such as insect growth regulators and pheromones, or aphidis and momento. For example, with insect growth regulators and pheromones, you may be running into a situation where you have fewer male scales on the card and higher number of radio scale populations in the block. And that's because IGRs are more effective in controlling males than females. Remember, males molt more compared to females. And pheromone disruption might be confusing the males so they can find the card. Um, and in another situation with aphidis and movento, you might be seeing more males, but actually less populations in your block because aphidis is targeting third, third and star uh, females and it's controlling the females. And when females are controlled, they don't produce crawlers. Um, but you might be seeing the males in the trap from earlier generation. And mov with movento, movento controls um, ready skill on leaves and fruits and twigs, but it doesn't affect ready skill that's on the wood. So the population might be developing on the wood, wood and that's what you're seeing um, on the trap cards. So in addition to the trap cards, you might also want to find out where the skill is present in your block during the season to make best management decisions. Um, sample the A's to determine if there is an AZ effect or, um, and also sample the interior and top, the wood area to see if you have any live scales that um, are present on the inside canopy of the tree. Um, Grady scales like to hang around on, even after they're dead. So you might want to also determine if the scales in your block are live. Uh, and you can do this easily by rubbing your thumb lightly over the scales. The dead scales are flaky and will come off easily, whereas live scales don't come off easily. Um, and after you evaluate the treatment, which you mostly are targeting uh, the first and star in first and second generation, you might want to sample um, your blocks and look for dead and healthy or parasitized um, scales if you are releasing a virus. You can also be proactive and plan for the next season. And you can do this by monitoring for male flight in the fourth generation. If you have more than 1,000 males per trap, um, then you might need to do something about ready skill in, in that block. Um, another way is to estimate the percentage of fruit. And if you have more than 5% of the fruit, that's infested at harvest. Um, that means that your block may have red skill um, situation in, in the following season and you might need to do something about it. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about why is skill so hard to control, especially in the last 10 years. Um, there are several factors that have contributed to creating this perfect storm for a ready scale population explosion. Um, in the last several years, we have had warm winter, and what that means is scales of all life stages are developing at all times. So there is not a particular um, life stage that you can target with um, insecticide application. And that also means less overwintering mortality, means more scale producing more crawlers. The second factor is drought and dust. Stressed trees have more scale and parasites don't really work well when the trees, um, when there is, you know, dust covering all the leaves. And that you can avoid, especially drought is, a, you can control by avoiding water stress to your trees. 
Another factor is heat. And as you can see in this graph on the left side, the degree day accumulation is on the y-axis and the times is um, time of the dates of the month are on the x-axis. And there are um, <clears throat> degree days required for first generation of males to come out, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, and fifth generation. What's happening is because of the high heat and fast development, development of stays because degree days is accumulating faster than before, we're seeing an extra generation. Um, and no insecticide treatment can control all five generations of scales. They usually work, last about uh, one generation, forcing our growers to treat more often. And some insecticides don't um, control scales of words such as imidacloprid and um, delegate. They don't control the skills and words allowing for populations to develop on word. Again, you know, that population spills over to um, the leaves and fruit in the next season. So basically we have got a perfect storm with heat, dust, insecticides that are moderately effective and allowing skills to survive on the wood. And everyone is struggling and wrestling with um, Ready scale being a pain in the last um, last decade. What can we do about it? One of the options many growers have taken is using mating disruption. These are um, dispensers that release pheromone that you can hang on your sorry that you can hang on your trees. Um, the recommended dose is 180 dispensers per acre. That's one dispenser per tree or two in some cases. And um, you deploy them early in the season, confuse the males so that males can find and mate with the females. And um, therefore that affects the whole thing and they can produce crawlers and ready school populations eventually is controlled. This um, chart over here and the table um, that I have shown here is from the work that Joe Leonard did for his master thesis, where he tested 180 dispensers per acre um, in big plots, 10, 20 acre plots, um, deploying these um, dispensers as early as in February. And what he found is in the blocks where they had dispensers, the male populations was shut down. They couldn't find um, male on the traps. Where is in the control, the male males were, you know, everywhere. And he also evaluated the percentage of fruit with more than 10 scales. Um, and what they found, what he found is out of the five replications, out of the four replications in, from five, there was more than 90% control in the percentage fruit infested with more than 10 scales. So it, it appears that the ferment dispenser really works. In this one replication where they did not get in control, it might be a numbers game. It, it may be that the, the field, that orchard had very high density of red school population. And when that happens, the male don't need to fly to find a female. They can just crowd a few inches um, and, and find a female. And that keeps the population, that keeps Ready skill populations in in the orchard. So disruptions really works best when you drive the populations down by applying the insecticides and combine that with um, with the pheromone disruption. And maybe you can get from you know applying uh, two to three applications to control ready skills per year down to applying one insecticides and combining that with uh, ferment disruption. So um, here are my recommendations for California ready scale management. Um, first thing is timing. Monitor and make sure you're hitting the stage that is most sensitive. So you're getting the highest percentage of skill with uh, the treatment method you choose. Second is attack first and second generations when the skill population is uniform and you know you, you have more control before it gets to the fruit. Um, 
if you miss that first and second generation, there are overlapping insect populations in third, fourth um, generation, and any method you choose may not effectively control all the all the um, radius scale. Third point um, to keep in mind is get a good covetous. Um, you you want to get to that scale that's on the interior canopy of the tree. And you can do that by increasing water volume, um, 750 to 1500 gallons per acre for most chemicals. For Movento, use lower water volume because it works better when the concentration is high. Um, drive slowly so that you're getting a good covers and avoid water stress to trees so that they're not susceptible to radius scale. And if you are combining a phytis release, then prevent release where, you know, don't let FIDs release overlap with your insecticide application, especially that of the broad spectrum insecticides. And um, in the groves that may have chronic radical problem, use the ferment disruption in combination with insecticide and FIDs. Ferment disruption may take, you know, a year, two year, many seasons to actually um, work, but, it, but the research has shown that it does um, work in combination with um, insecticides. Okay, uh, this information, I wanted to include this here, although it may not be, uh, you know, uh, very relevant information for the growers, uh, mostly relevant for packers and sippers, zipper, because California Radius Scale is also an export concern pest. It's a, it is a quarantine pest in South Korea, where we export more than 220 million a worth of citrus every year. And despite all the field IPM, they say that 90% of the shipment has some scale of radius, some label of radius scale infestation. There are lights, we don't know that. Um, and currently they use methyl bromide as a blanket fumigation to all the citrus that's arriving um, in South Korea, but that treatment is no, you know, it's, it may not be available in future. And over the last five, um, six years, in collaboration with Dr. Spencer, Swa Spencer Walls Lab at USC ARS, we have evaluated several post-harvest treatments to control radius scale. And we have many options, phosphine at 1000 ppm for 48 hours or 24 hours when used as a part of system approach effectively controls radius scale. There are other post-harvest fumigant, propylene oxide and methyl formate that control radius scale within like one or two hour application. Um, the non-chemical method, store is during transit temperature, about three weeks to three week time that it takes for fruit to arrive um, to South Korea from Los Angeles. That temperature storage alone kills all the radius scale that's present on the fruit. And if you're using pressure wash in the pack line, it's effective in removing all the radius scale from the fruit and killing anything that remains on the fruit. And currently we're evaluating combining all these systems and um, looking at the effect of the combined system on ready scale, including other um, export concern tests. Um, in this slide, what I have done is I've shared some of the educational resources that you might want to check out. There is an extension course through UCANR, um, and there is a lot of information on California ready scale on UCIPM guidelines. Um, California ready and another, thing, another way you could learn about Ready Scale is through the Ready Scale workshop that I will be putting together and um, organizing for in September of 2021, where we'll be talking in detail about California Ready Scale biology, how to monitor it, the natural enemies, and the options for management. Um, so be sure uh, on the lookout for emails um, if you're interested in learning more about California Ready Scale. Next, um, I'm switching gears and going to now talk about Asian citrus psyllid scouting and management. Um, you all are very familiar with Asian citrus psyllid and the one year new disease that it transmits. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, talking about what it is. Um, oh, um, there is a link down here. I can't see that. Um, there's a link down here, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay, this link is a great resource. If you want to know where Asian citrus is present, 
how close it is in proximity to your grove um, and, and the disease. It's a really interactive map. Um, you can go check it out. It, it's a great learning resource as well. So um, let's jump to Asian citrus psyllid now. ACP is a small insect, as small as an aphid. Um, it likes to deposit eggs on the new flush. And flush is the term we hear a lot with ACP and citrus. Um, what it means is it's that new growth that's just coming out, which is very tender and soft and perfect for um, feeding for insects, sap sucking insects like Asian citrus psyllid. The Asian citrus psyllid, what it does, the adult finds a growing flush and lays, it, lays the egg in there and eggs, when they hatch, they start feeding. They, they need to start feeding on that new flush as it develops and broadens and, um, and expands. The nymphs can only survive on the new tender flush. So the adults are, so if you're looking for Asian citrus psyllid, it's best to look in, in the new flush because that's where they, they are, that's where all the action is happening. Um, getting started with the scouting and monitoring, um, let's first think about what makes ACP move and disperse. Um, thinking like an ACP, adults can fly, um, nymph movement is limited. So if adults, you know, decide that they want to fly, they will go find a new, uh, new tree or new flus to, to reproduce and feed on. That may be triggered by disturbance, which could be during the normal operations like harvesting or insecticide application or pruning of the trees that triggers disturbance and ACP feels like it needs to take off and go find a new, new tree to, to land on. Another theory is that after reaching a certain density, ACP will move and find new areas to infest. And we don't really know what that number is, but that's, it's likely that as the population gets dense and dense, the adults tend to, tend to move and find um, newer areas to infest. Another reason might be uh, the availability and the quality of food. Fillets like soft tender food and if there is um, a new flush on the you know like next tree then they would move to that new flush and that's how they penetrate from aces in into um, the orchard the other way that acp could move is passive dispersal when people move psyllids on plants vehicles equipments and bulk surplus Um, and for scouting, there are two uh, methods, passive scouting and active scouting. Passive is uh, using yellow sticky cards to monitor for populations. It is a great tool um, for monitoring dispersal into newer areas um, because it can be strategically placed along the edges of the grove. Uh, it's constantly out there over time and you can replace it and you can count and you can have an idea of how things are progressing over time. Disadvantage to passive scouting is it's labor intensive. You have to find uh, and replace those traps every week or bi-weekly um, and it can get costly. Um, you also need trained, um, trained personnel to identify, you know, those people who are looking at the cards to be trained to identify ACPs. And sometimes you might be getting false negatives. Um, meaning that you may not find any adults in the card, but you may have a population in, in your block. Active scouting is when you are in the grove, actively looking for a sensor And there are two types. One is visual sampling. That is finding the flush and counting the number of eggs, nymphs, and adults in the flush. Um, you need a hand lens for this because eggs are eggs and nymphs are small 
harder to see and they are pretty much tucked. They can be tucked inside that growing, um, growing flush. Um, where there is no young flush, another way to sample for adults is using the tap sampling method. And what you do in this is you use a mallet, something that you can tap with, and you pick a pick a branch that's about one inch in diameter, and you tap that really hard onto a surface and catch whatever falls of that branch and count the adults. And because of the disturbance, the adults just fall and like to lay there. They're not going to fly, and you can you know you can pretty much do the counts. Um, if you're looking for a perfect method, combining passive with active sampling is ideal. Uh, you might want to replace the yellow sticky cards bi-weekly and based on that number, um, do the visual sampling when there is flush, um, go with the tap sampling method when there is no flush, always focus on the edges of the grove because that's where ECP likes to hang out before moving on to um, the interior of, uh, of the block. And once you do this over many, many seasons, you might get, a, get an idea of where in your block ACP starts infesting and you might identify your hotspot. So it's a good idea to start from your identified hotspot and then move from there. Where ACP is not established, especially in the valley, passive sampling using yellow sticky cards, and whenever there is uh, a find, then you go to visual sampling. So, um, this, the goal for essential solid management, especially for the valley, is. Um, to reduce the psyllid and the number of spread of the disease together with the psyllid. Current approach is ACP and HLP quarantine. There are different reasons, zones established based on the ACP find and HLP find, and um, there are regulations that are required, that the growers are required to spray and then move the fruit between these quarantine zones um, 14 days before the harvest with an approved insecticide that controls acinsetracillin. Uh, some of these are Danitol, Bethroid, Tombstone, Mustang, Ectara, et cetera. Or another option is to feel king, remove all the stems and leaves and brush and wash the fruit before moving. It's not a very good idea because washing fruit creates other issues um, with the fruit. Um, tarping is another um, regulation, that is, regulation that is required. 100% of the citrus load that is traveling between quarantine zones for bulk citrus are required to uh, be tarp. And um, in future, post harvest treatment is needed for bulk citrus. And we have worked on evergreen fogging and ethylfermate fumigation, which are very um, effective options. We evaluated ethyl format um, to control ECP in bulk citrus in Riverside in 2019, where um, what we did is we had the ECP in these modified cases, which were then buried in fruit within all the bins. And um, then it was tarped with the tarpaulin um, and fumigated with ethyl format during one hour fumigation at ambient temperature, which was around 60 degrees that day. Um, and we killed all the um, all the acinsetracillin. This fumigant ethylfermate is in the process of registration and may soon be available as um, as a treatment option. ACP management goals, especially here in the valley, are to um, prevent ACP coming into the valley. Despite all these regulations, we still see. Um, Sell it on trap cards from time to time, which is shown here um, on, on this table. Um, there are some years where we start seeing um, ACP. I think 2015 is where we start seeing ACP, which triggers um, eradicative coordinated treatments, which is 
application of two insecticides um, during a 30-day interval. It could be two foliar insecticides or foliar followed by a systemic, systemic insecticide, which then you would apply immediately after the foliar application because systemic insecticide takes longer to um, longer to get absorbed and be you know make make it to the um, tree. The eradicative treatment is fairly effective because you see a high population. There is an eradicative treatment that growers are required to treat 800 meters, and you knock that population down. Next year you don't see ACPs, but then again it's it's coming into um, into the valley. Uh, in Southern California, growers treat together over a two to three week window. Usually in fall and winter, that's coordinated by PMAs and pest control districts um, using the insecticides that have known efficacy against acinsetracillate. In urban areas, in residential um, and in the household, they release Tamaraxia parasite to control acinsetracillate. And within the HLB quarantine, conventional treatment to keep AC, ACP populations in check. Um, okay, next, um, what I'm going to share is um, the resource, resource results that Dr. Monique Rivera has asked me to share with you from uh, the work that her group has been um, doing down in Riverside. Um, in 2020, they tested two different products, Cephina, which is um, recently approved for use in 2020, and Cebanto, which again is a recent approval. Um, they run the trials using maximum label rate for Cephina, Cebanto, um, and Movento, which is a standard uh, pesticide for controlling ACP. They didn't use any in, um, edge event because the objective here was to evaluate how effective the insecticide is without aiding the edge event. Uh, this trial was done in Palmer Valley um, on young trees down in San Diego. Uh, speed sprayer was used, and I'm not very familiar with the specification of the spinner and size of the nozzle there. Um, you all know better than um, I do. And the water volume used was 200 gallons per acre. And one of the exciting thing here was compared to Movento, which is the standard choice, both Cephina and Cevanto are substantially cheaper options. What they found, um, th these are the results, which looks very exciting. Um, the, blue bar, the blue bars here are the pre-treatment counts, which is anywhere from three to between three to four two to four names uh, per plus. And um, red bar is one day after the treatment. Yellow bar is three day after the treatment. Green bar is seven day after the treatment. Orange bar is 14 days after the treatment. And 21, um, purple bar is 21 days after the treatment. The red line that runs across the graph is the treatment threshold for Eastern Citrusylid, which is 0 0.5 names per flush. And what this um, result, what this data is showing is that on untreated control, your ACP populations nymphs were always higher than the um, treatment economic threshold. Sivanto um, had a weird result. It knocked down the population one days after the treatment, but then they came back. Um, this could be because Cevanto doesn't really work on eggs, uh, but kills the nymphs. And that might be the reason, or um, we don't know. We need to figure that out. Um, but it, does, it did a fairly good job of keeping the populations down that economic threshold level for the seven day, 14 day, and 21 day count. Um, Movento seems to be the most effective insecticides for keeping the population down um, during all um, counts from anywhere from one day to 14 days after the treatment, 21 days after the treatment. 
and Sefina took a little while to bring that population down to um, down below economic threshold level, but eventually it came down to um, to below the economic threshold level. Another thing that could maybe happening here is that uh, Everest temperatures during these trials might be contributing towards higher efficacy of uh, insecticide, especially seven days and 21 days after the treatment, because uh, the pretreatment during the pretreatment counts, the temperature max was 96 degrees centigrade and um, seven, 14 days, the maximum temperature was 102, 21 days after the treatment, it was um, 104 degrees. Nothing like, nothing unlike uh, normal temperatures in Southern California, but um, it does appear like it's in such a solid, what the solid was, the heat was aiding to the control by um, insecticides. I need to move this panel here. Okay. Um, these are preliminary results. Um, there still is more data that um, they need to bring in. They're counting for 21 days after the treatment. Um, that result, still, we still need to see that result to determine how effective um, all these compounds are to control acin citrus solid up to about four weeks. They found that Movento gave the best results and Sefina gave the second best results. Um, these bo both of these insecticides have translaminar activity, meaning that the application get absorbed, gets absorbed by the leaf and it, it moves to the lower side of the leaf where we didn't receive the insecticide application and makes that AI available for any insect feeding on the lower side of the leaf. Sefina, seven days after control, it, uh, Seven days after the treatment, control well, maybe um, may have some translaminar activity, um, but more research is needed uh, to confirm that. Sivanto was an odd one here. Um, it may also have translaminar activity, but probably less. Um, or the odd result may be because it's not very effective in controlling, um, controlling the aches. Um, and as I said earlier, temperature likely helped the control. Um, and these were the results from just using the AI. So in combining them with adjuvants will likely improve the results. And they are setting up um, trials this year in July and looking at treatments, more treatments, Exeril, Minectopro, BLEF, Movento, Delegate, and Sequoia on Essence Citrocellid. Now, um, moving on to the ACP management from the results from the organic greenhouse trial uh, done by Dr. Rivera's group. Here on this chart, what they, here they work with 5.0 pyanic and combined that with different oils. Um, they started with average number of nymphs um, per plant, which was about anywhere from 70 to below 90. Um, and uh, counted, counted the nymphs per plant up to 35 days after the treatment. And what they found is where it, in the untreated control, the populations remain fairly um, stable until day seven and on day 14, they had a Low population of nymph probably because remaining nymphs mostly turn into adults this, by this point. Um, what was interesting to see here was that um, all the all treatments of pyganic, including other oils, fairly did a good job of controlling um, the nymph populations during all. Um, up to 35 days. So uh, the conclusions here, this is so um, initial results from greenhouse trials, but so is that full rate of pyganic plus 1% as a direct had the best overall knockdown and control. 
Um, Meltdown is the key because these products have very residual active, very uh, little residual activity and field trials um, will be completed shortly and that might give us a better insight into how effective these products are um, in the field. Uh, what about the Sanokin Valley? What about ACP control in the Sanokin Valley? As I mentioned before, uh, if ACP is found on traps in the valley, they're the eradicative, eradicative treatments are triggered. That means um, the growers are asked to treat 800 meters um, in coordinated treatments using insecticides that are effective against acin citrocyllid. And there are several insecticides that are used for controlling acin, um, other insect pests in the valley that are effective against the ACP. For example, Delegate, exeral, spanosad, and carbaryl that are used to control citrus strips effectively controls um, acin citrocyllid. If you are trying to use, if you still have uh, that compound that you can use against um, ACP, um, Ectara works on um, ACP as well. Movento is very effective in controlling acin citrocyllid. Seven. Um, is also very effective in controlling acin citrocyllid. So, uh, yeah, what did I want to? What else did I want to say here? So, if you uh, if you see acin citrocyllid um, in the valley, sometimes let's say around anywhere from July to October, the growers are uh, required to do the treatments within um, two weeks after the tra trap find. So you can time your applications accordingly so that you're controlling both ready scale and, and the ACP with one treatment. That's what I wanted to say there. Um, how much time do I have to go over the rest of the material? I can leave here or I can talk more about the other citrus pests. Um, actually, we're kind of out of time. <laughs> Thank you for checking yeah. in. Then I, I will, um, I'll just leave it here. Um, I, don't, I don't have you know, I had data for from some preliminary results to talk about, but I want to leave leave um, you with this slide, which talks about uh, the key pests here in the valley, which are red mites, uh, and they're what they're what is used to control them, and what timeline you should be targeting to control these these pests. So for citrus red mites, are they're a problem from February to May. You could use oils and miticides to control them. Summer heat controls them. Uh, you may not even need to spray anything. Citrus strips are fairly um, huge problem, especially because of res resistance to delegate that's developing in many, many of the populations. And we have compounds that are effective against uh, citrus strips. The window for treatment is very narrow for citrus strips. You want to hit um, the orchard after the petal fall before the fruit size is bigger than 2.5 centimeters. Um, for citricular red scale and California red scale, depending on the populations, you want to target first generation uh, and second generation, and that could be anywhere from July to August, September. So that's all I have. Okay, um, I think I will just ask maybe one or two questions before we close out. And so with that, I will, we have a lot of questions, um, If, but I, I, I think I'll just ask a couple. So one person asked, how do California red scale move between trees and orchards? Um, that's a really good question. Crowler is the only stays that can move. So crowlers can move, they, but they don't move much. The way that red scale moves from one orchard to another orchard is when crowlers get blown by wind and they just land on a citrus tree in the next orchard. They can't move very far, but that's, they, it has to be some kind of assisted movement. It, within the orchard, they can move from tree to tree because they, they can, you know, they can fairly move. Okay, and the next question is, as winters warm up in the San Joaquin Valley, are the generations of CRS spreading out with a range of life stages present all the time? Is this making it hard to time sprays and is it improving the activity of aphidus parasites? 
Um, yes and yes. Uh, it's making, you know, as the pop, as the winters get warm, what that means is we're not getting overwintering mortality. And what that translates to is there are crawlers being produced all over and the scales developing, meaning that all life stages are present at all times. And with insecticide applications, you are targeting a particular life stage to get a kill because get high percentage kill because if, um, and if there are, you know, second instar and third instar, which are harder to penetrate with uh, insecticide application, you might not be getting, you will kill them, but not 100% or not, not high, um, high percentage. So what that does it is it allows for the populations to survive and that means more scale. So yes, they, they kind of sprayed and it make it, it's making the management difficult. Was, was that all, all or there was more to the question? Oh, um, I think I think that was correct. Um, unless uh, there was a little, there was a part about um, is it making the aphidus parasites more effective uh, as well? Here in the valley, aphidus the the heat, especially the summer heat, um, affects aphidus as well. Um, but we we don't really know presence of all life stages during um, the winter may mean that. We, uh, we might get, if I, there is food for aphidus to complete their generation and that may mean that aphidus can be present year round, but then that population might get knocked down in the summer heat, then we're losing aphidus. So um, there is no clear answer to that. Okay. Um, okay, so to respect um, all of our attendees time, thank you all for, uh, for being here. Um, I think we will wrap up now. Thank you so much, Dr. Gautam. Uh, for being here and for and for presenting this information. Um, and everybody, thank you for attending and have a great day.